Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and at least from California. I want to welcome you to the uh, NACOM presentation on the Plaster Superior Courts approach to an integrated remote appearance system. I'm Jake Chatter, is the court executive officer for the Plaster County Superior Court. And joining me today is Greg Harding, uh, our information technology director. Over the next hour, we're going to share with you uh, our approach to integrated remote appearances. <clears throat> we'll take you through the questions that we asked ourselves uh, prior to the pandemic and present what I think are questions that each of us needs to continue to ask as we move forward from our current state into uh, what we hope to be a very vibrant and successful future. So let me get started here. So we're going to walk through what we mean when we talk about an authentic court experience through remote technology. I'll certainly share with you um, what the pandemic has brought and some of our considerations. Walk you through what we believe are the foundational questions as each of us approaches a world where remote technology uh, has now become part of our everyday court system uh, and what that looks like for our users, for ourselves, uh, for our judges, administrators, staff as we move forward. We'll then talk you through what we see as our integrated design to remote appearances, both from a, a policy standpoint and through our actual technical architecture. I will show you a couple of quick demonstrations and point you to a third um, that you can go view uh, if you would like off our website. We'll provide some quick lessons learned, um, which may uh, sync up with what you've learned yourselves in your courts uh, or may provide some additional perspective. And then we'll leave some time for questions uh, at the end. Um, I'll try and take some as you enter them into, uh, as we go through, Greg or I will try and address them, but we wanna save some time at the end. So first, I wanna talk about our goal. You know, Our goal uh, when we started this project back uh, actually in 2016 was to create a remote appearance system that was integrated into our court process that provides an authentic court experience to the greatest extent possible. So what do we mean by that? We mean that we want for the users that it is a process that is understandable. It is a process that those with um, a relatively moderate level of technology savvy can understand and can accomplish. We want for the court users for them to know that their process is fair, that whether they are appearing in person or they're appearing via remote technology, that they have had access to their system uh, in an equal fashion. For our clerk's office and for all our processing staff, we want it to be predictable. We want it to not add too significant and additional burden to uh, the work that they are trying to accomplish. Uh, and we want to avoid the one-off, we wanted to avoid the one-off technology and video solutions um, that happened over the years, right? Like many of you, we had systems that connected us to state hospitals or state prisons. We had separate situations when a witness wanted to appear from across the country. Uh, or perhaps someone was uh, unable to come to court and needed to appear from a local hospital. We wanted to find a way to make that all more predictable and part of our standard process. So we didn't have to spend quite as much time uh, on the scheduling and update and verification process. For an authentic experience for our courtroom staff, that means we want it to be staged. We want people to be in line. We want to be able to control who is speaking, who is not speaking. We wanna know who's coming up next. We wanna know their names. Uh, and want to replicate as calm a process as possible through video as would be in person. For our IT and our administrative staff, we obviously wanted to be financially sustainable uh, and we wanted from an IT perspective to be secure. And we'll talk a little more through that as we go through. And obviously for our judicial officers, you know, they need the law and they need the case in front of them and they need the parties. And so any remote appearance solution that we wanted to implement as we designed had to be effective had to minimize interruption and disruption, and had to allow the proceeding to move forward in as much as it could in person to the greatest extent possible. So we set these goals and defined this idea of an authentic court experience um, back in 2016 and entering into 2017, and it guided our process into what we view as our integrated approach. And so ultimately that goes on to combine to be that we wanted to create, and I think we have created, a remote appearance solution that is not a standalone solution, but is fully integrated to both our core process and our core business systems. So we did all this though uh, before COVID. And so I do wanna talk a minute about what that means. And as I walk through the presentation today, 
how I know you're viewing the comments that we're making and the statements we're making. So we started this project via what was called the uh, Court Innovations Grant Program, uh, was funded by the legislature and the governor in 2016. And the funds and the grant was made to us uh, by the California Judicial Council in 2017. We worked and achieved our initial launch of our remote uh, system pilot through our integrated system in December of 2019. And we'll walk through some of those case types. And we'd planned to present this in July uh, of this year as what we thought would be a pretty unique uh, and new concept. Although many of us have done um, video arrangements and others, but to have a fully integrated system. Now, spring 2020 comes, every one of us adjusts to COVID and overnight remote appearances impact all of us everywhere. So as an example, in December, 2019, we launched our self-help appointments via our online system that led us into January of 2020 with uh, probation transfer review hearings. So that individuals uh, in our context might be down in San Francisco, uh, seeking to transfer probation to San Francisco rather than have them drive uh, several hours here to Placer County. We would allow them to appear remotely by video. We started that in January, 2020. We converted our uh, mental health hospital hearings and state hospitals uh, into a more integrated approach with the new system. And we offered victim impact statements in domestic violence cases uh, beginning in January, although we did not have anyone sign up, but we did offer it in January. And in March of 2020, uh, we had planned to uh, implement our system for small claims, UDs, and civil harassments. Those were planned to start on Monday, uh, on a Monday, and the Friday before the court uh, closed down most of its functions in response to COVID, including those case types. So what then happened? Well, like most of you, uh, or many of you at least, we expanded where we offer remote hearings between March and May to include virtually every hearing type. Uh, we have listed here on the screen what those included, you know, criminal arraignments, out of custody pretrial hearings, including some preliminary hearings uh, for in custody defendants. Uh, all were launched as a result of COVID and, um, and the pandemic for all of us. We expanded uh, telephone hearings to family law, law in motion type matters, and to civil law in motion matters. Uh, those were already by telephone. We've mandated small claims be remote uh, by video at this point. So really, like all of you, our experience expanded rapidly. And we took a system that was intended as a pilot and turned it into a production system virtually overnight. So as we walk through today, um, what I want to be articulating is that each one of us responded in an emergency and implemented expanded remote hearings in your jurisdictions and our jurisdiction. And we did that to make sure that we could continue to provide access to justice in our communities, to make sure our systems moved forward to the greatest extent they can uh, or could, and understanding that that varied by jurisdiction uh, based on those needs uh, in that jurisdiction or what orders existed from your uh, various governments. And what I challenge all of us now is that it's time for us to start to look beyond the crisis, although we're still in it, to varying degrees, but what does normalcy look like um, beyond the crisis and how do we implement remote appearances and where do we preserve them where we found them to be effective? And what I would say is that the questions we're asking ourselves have not changed from the questions that we asked back in 2017 and 2018 as we built our system. And despite our experience, they remain the same questions. We just have more knowledge and more uh, pilots behind us, large pilot, uh, to make those decisions. So what do we perceive those found foundational questions to be? Well, there are a lot. They go all the way from, can we be sure people can hear? Is the process legal? Who do we require to appear? Do we allow the public to appear? Do people need prior approval? How do we get signatures? Do we charge? How do we do a DQ? How do you handle someone who's being uniquely disruptive? So all those questions, uh, which you've asked yourselves over the last several months, they will persevere and they will still be there, maybe the wrong term, they'll still be there when we exit this pandemic and this emergency. And we have to decide how are we going to deal with each of these questions in our unique court systems and how do we make video appearances as authentic as possible? So ultimately these questions break down in our opinion into two. There's the policy design questions and the system design. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how we as a court uh, prior to the pandemic looked at due process and eligibility questions, how we addressed scheduling, how we made every attempt to ensure we had productive hearings. Talk about the uh, 
big challenge that con confronted us mid project, which is how to deal with evidence. And then finally, one that I'm not going to have a great answer for you for, but public end user support. And then I'm going to transition it over to Greg, and he's going to walk you through what our tool looks like, how we have integrated it into our CMS, AV systems, dealt with identity, evidence, and security. So in terms of policy, what we have, we defined very early on is that we decided we wanted three separate sets of hearing types. We wanted to define and make clear which hearing types are default eligible, which we did and we continue to do and update on our website so that there are a group of hearings that individuals know they can appear by phone or they can appear by video uh, without the need to reach prior approval. And that opens up, we'll come on the next slide, all kinds of options in terms of system design to allow that people to provide to self-serve rather than need to add a new process for the court. Separately, we sought to define those hearings that are subject to approval of the judicial officer and go through our request process. And we've developed forms for those, as I'm sure many of you have. And then third, we wanted to define the hearings that required agreement of the other party. Very early on in our process, we knew that the state of the law on video appearances uh, certainly varies by jurisdiction. But in California, uh, at least to date, the mention of video appearances falls into largely one category on civil cases and family law cases in which the code requires the court to charge a fee if it offers video appearance. Uh, beyond that, there is very little to no mention of video appearances. And so we defaulted very early um, on most situations to require consent by the opposing counsel or opposing side if we were going to proceed by video. So what I encourage each of each of us to do as we move beyond the pandemic and look at the case types and the hearing types that we've uh, offered is to return to this question and ask ourselves, which types of hearings do we want to have default eligible by phone and video or both? Which ones do we want to have approval by the judges and the commissioners or, or the judicial officers in your jurisdiction? And which of those are going to require agreement and how to accomplish that agreement? Based on those decisions, we then built our system to address each of those three scenarios separately. For those items where people can self-schedule, we actually allow them to on uh, through the video appearance system. Uh, we'll go into a larger view of this on the bottom left here a little bit later in the demonstration, uh, but parties are able to go online. They are able to identify their upcoming hearings. If those hearings are eligible for a video or telephone appearance uh, through self-scheduling, they can simply select the event and sign up and receive notification. We also define that there are hearings that are routinely set with justice partners, and we did not want to have to individually set those and send out links to those hearings. And so we did build a uh, batch upload process through a CSV file, which Greg will talk about, to allow us to mass schedule nightly uh, into our system and be able to send out those links. And lastly, we wanted to have a process that was easy to use for staff to schedule parties. So those circumstances that require the judicial officer to approve the appearance, once it's approved, have an easy to use method for staff to enter in that appearance and send out the links. Core to all of this and going back to the integrated approach and authentic court experience is we wanted to automate the sending of all links and pins to participants to avoid the extra work on court staff. So that is core to our system and what we built from the very beginning. In terms of productive hearings, you know, things that we wanted to address is we wanted to avoid confusion over, I can't find my way to access. How do I uh, join the hearing? Um, did I download the correct app? Does my browser work? So our goal was to provide simple access to the hearing through an email-based uh, notification system, which obviously has become the norm at this point. Uh, in our scenario, we do send an email to the participants with a link to instructions, with a link uh, to their remote appearance or the website itself in order to enter their PIN if they want to go that route. And then rather than embed instructions for that specific hearing type, because they do vary, it does link them off to their hearing type for further instructions. We publish detailed instructions to try and uh, simplify the process and explain it as much as we can. For individuals here, we have a quick thumbnail of what is currently on our website for small claims cases to walk them through how to sign up, how to cancel, uh, how to upload evidence, which we'll talk about, and how to conduct the appearance itself. But to get a truly authentic hearing, we also wanted to avoid unnecessary continuances. Uh, and so we started to address how to handle stipulations to a subordinate judicial, judicial officer when required, 
to avoid the same day continuances because our fear uh, was that cases would come up on calendar, someone would challenge the judicial officer or not stipulate, and it would be difficult for us to shift that over um, to a new courtroom. So we did integrate sign now as the version we used. You could use DocuSign or some other um, electronic signature application. We did integrate sign now to our case management system uh, and as a process that we go through in advance of hearings that require a stipulation uh, to send the stipulation to the parties in advance and request that they send that back to us signed via sign now and to, for it to then automatically go back into the case management system. We also implemented sign now so that in the event, uh, well, as we use it today, we use it for our plea forms. Uh, in the event someone is appearing remotely on a criminal case, um, which is not required in California, it is an option for the defendant and defense counsel. Um, but if they do choose to do so and they do reach a plea agreement, uh, we use sign now to send those plea agreements to them uh, and then have them return to the courtroom so that that proceeding can complete uh, the day of the hearing and not require a delay. Same was true initially that we thought on stipulations or on settled agreements that might occur during the course of the hearing. We wanted to have the ability to execute that and ensure that that is completed uh, prior to the end of that hearing day uh, to avoid you know, potential resolution of cases crumbling later. It was also very important to us to make sure that we could heavily manage the calls. So on the left here um, is what our operators see. So our courtroom clerks in our context uh, manage the calls for the ability to mute, hold, end, and subconference. Um, I mean, I know everyone is using different tools, whether you're using you know, Zoom or BlueJeans or WebEx or Teams. In this case, we use uh, vCourt from Streamright, which we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about. But we wanted to be sure that the courtroom clerk uh, or the judge, if they chose to do it themselves, uh, had complete control to deal with disruptive behavior, to be able to see who was on the line, uh, to be able to send them to a subconference to hold, mute, and end. Uh, we had that for our telephone appearance system, and so this was seeking to expand that to video appearances. And again, that goes to an authentic experience, and in the courtroom we have control. We want to ensure we have that on the remote side. And then on the right, we also, as I said, integrated sign now into our case management system. So in the event we need to secure signatures on the day of the hearing, we can do so. And for us, that's what we talk about when we are referring to uh, an integrated design is that every component of the hearing is being taken care of from how did some, how are people identifying that they're eligible? How do they go about getting agreement to appear? How do they receive their link uh, to appear in the hearing? How do we control that behavior? How do we queue cases? How do we deal with stipulations and agreements? As we worked through the system, we'd initially planned on doing self-help. We'd planned on doing some criminal hearings. Uh, we thought we would uh, potentially do traffic cases. We ultimately decided not to. So instead, um, we wanted to try out some civil cases. We decided to try in small claims and unlawful detainer cases. And that brought us to the question of discovery and evidence. And we'll go into evidence in a moment. Our take was that it is not the court's responsibility to be involved in discovery uh, from a broad perspective, except in small claims and landlord tenant cases. And the reason is, as you all, as for those who've been in small claims court uh, may have experienced, is often what happens is the day of the hearing, the litigants in the small claims case come to court. They each have their binder full of documentation, uh, maybe organized it, maybe not. Um, they have a few moments before the start of the hearing uh, to exchange that evidence with one another, and then the hearing begins. So a large challenge is how do you replicate that process when one party is remote and one party is in person? And how do you replicate it when both parties are remote? I will say replicating it for both parties being remote uh, was a design challenge just to build it, but doesn't change all that much, right? They're both remote. They're both uploaded their evidence, which we'll talk about, and they can share it and look at it. Real challenge becomes what happens if one person is here in the building with us. So we spent a lot of time defining uh, how to control uh, remote parties and in-person parties with evidence. We'll talk through that a little bit uh, in a moment. And how do we avoid instituting a level of unfairness or advantage to either the in-person party or the remote party? So we will uh, describe some of that as we go through a quick demonstration. But we did acknowledge that we have to have a way for the court to view exhibits during the hearing. 
and exactly how is the courtroom clerk going to manage admitting exhibits? How are we going to manage eliminating them for the judge to view them, for the parties to view them, and to have a truly productive hearing? So that is our, from a policy standpoint, we wanted to address what is due process and what is fair. How do we provide information to the parties? How do we ensure the process is smooth for our clerks? How do we make sure there's not disruptive behavior? How do we secure agreements? And how do we deal with evidence? So we approached all of those with the guy, with the uh, approach that we wanted to be authentic, and that led to a system design that Greg is going to talk you through now. So Greg, I will turn it to you. Thank you, Jake. The system design was made possible by a collaboration process involving ATI, Streamrite, Compunetics, and the Judicial Council Technology Division, working closely with the court. The court had a telephonic remote appearance system that was created by ATI, and this system builds on top of that system. The public interface, or vCourt, is our main core application. Let's go back one. The public interface for vCourt, the court needed a way to allow the end user's ability to sign up and if needed, pay for a remote appearance. The interface will be shown later on how this is done, but basically the, the front end interface allows the customer to log in, uh, look up the case by their case number, and if their case is eligible, schedule the remote appearance with little or no support from the court. Originally, this was going to be a small pilot, as Jake explained, but during COVID-19, it expanded greatly. The court worked with the Judicial Council Technology Division and Streamrite to develop an interface that used the statewide identity management system. The goal of this system is to allow users to log into any court system using one username and password. Once the user logs into the interface, they are asked to enter a case number. And again, if that case number has an available event, they are allowed to schedule a hearing. The core system or the conference manager hardware was a CompuNetics evergreen solution that ATI and Streamlight worked together to customize for the court. The system is comprised of three components. The Evergreen Cypress MCU is an on-premise media control unit that will allow up to 86 concurrent columns. That is the size of the court bot for our pilot because we were looking at having a small uh, amount of callers in. They offer various sizes of that application and it can expand up to thousands of callers if need be. The CompuMedix Companion server allows the MCU to support WebRTC connections. So what this allows is basically any PC, laptop, tablet, or cell phone that has a WebRTC compatible browser, Google Chrome, Firefox, Safari, or Microsoft Edge can use our system without having to download any applications. Using WebRTC requires you to have a co-turned server. The co-turned server could be a off-the-shelf freeware product. The court decided to use a hardened appliance in order to ensure security of the calls and make sure that the, the connections were as secure as possible. As Jake stated many times, our entire system was designed around one concept. It had to be easy for the public and the court staff to use. The system is fully integrated into the court's system. What this means is that it ties into our case management system and which extracts data on a daily basis, which is, allows the court to decide which events can and cannot be uh, scheduled remotely. If the event is always allowed, the user can go in and schedule that event and pay a fee of actable. If the event has to be approved, then the user would send in a form and the court staff would be able to schedule that event for the user. 
The court also has the ability to do batch scheduling if we're scheduling for our justice partners or if there's multiple people scheduling for the same event. This is a quicker process than doing it one at a time. The remote user connections. The court had an option when we first started looking at this of having either an application, which is what BlueGene or Zoom or some of the other uh, remote appearance systems use, or by going to a web RTC. We elected to go to a web RTC approach because it meant that the users did not have to download anything and could just use their current system. The WebRTC platform works on all current browsers, Android phones, tablets, Apple devices, iPads, laptops, desktops, and Mac computers. The only exception to this was that our state hospitals and our California state prison system only use Cisco codexes for their remote appearances. So we were not able to have all of our remote appearances come in through the remote system some of them are still have to run through Cisco devices as those two large institutions only support those for their various security reasons. The Branch Azure Identity Manager system is a statewide approach to allow users to have one login to all court systems. Placer court, Superior Court is the first court to use this in a public application and we are pleased to announce that it has been working seamlessly through the entire project. The key component to the Streamrite v court system that is offered by our court is that it does tie into our case management system. What this does is it goes into our case management system on a daily basis and pulls the information out of our case management system and stores it in the vCourt application. This allows the users to go in and schedule any allowed remote appearance. What it also does is by having the data stored in the vCourt system, if there happened to be a system outage on the case management system, it would not prohibit the users from scheduling. This also allows the information to be pushed back into our case management system after the user is scheduled. And this includes pushing back in the, fee, the, fi, the fees for remote appearance. And then the case management system is able to distribute those fees. So this is a 100% hands-off solution that allows the end user to schedule and pay for the remote appearance system without any course personnel having to be involved. One of the other key components for our court was making sure that this system tied into the courtroom AV system. The Placer Superior Court has a fully customized AV system. The system includes several components. Chief among them is a telephone interface and a video interface, which allows remote conferencing. The V court system had to integrate into the system in a simple way that allowed our clerks the ability to use the advanced AV system without adding an overcomplicated approach to the process. The V court system was able to do this by using the operator console, which was shown in a previous slide, and by clicking a button. Once they click that button, they can either connect to the telephone conference or the video conference or both with only having to say accept on the main screen of the, of the AV system. The next component of the integrated design system was our court SharePoint server, which ties into our evidence system. The court discovered about half of the process that in order to have a truly remote appearance system that mimicked the in-person appearance, you had to have a way to, to present evidence. The court worked with Streamrite and developed a custom user interface that ties into the court SharePoint servers.
the public user interface allows the users to log in using the statewide identity management system and click on the evidence tab. Once they click on that tab, if their event is evidence eligible, they are allowed to upload the evidence. This upload goes into the court's SharePoint server and allows the clerk and operators to see that evidence. While the file is being uploaded, it goes through various states of the court's network and is scanned by no less than five antivirus systems to make sure that we have no viruses being uploaded. The court also limits the file size and the file type that can be uploaded. For more information about that, please visit the court's website at www.placer.courts.ca.gov. To take a brief moment to run through, uh, before I even do that, sort of the life of a case in our system. Because when we talk about this, and I think as you all talk about remote appearances in your jurisdictions, you know, the court process, we know, you know, we live it every day, we know how complicated it is, but some of those elements do get lost on others. So we walk through a case uh, and how it might inter interface here. Party files their their case uh, via e-filing, perhaps, or, or in paper if, if necessary. They schedule their hearing, just like they would schedule their hearing any other way by requesting a hearing date via a motion, at issue memorandum, you know, however it's getting set on your actual court calendar. So that's all happening as it traditionally has been done. Uh, we make no changes to that. The only difference is now we have a flag that runs nightly through the interface with the remote appearance system that checks each hearing type um, based on the hearing event code and, at, and decides whether or not it is telephone eligible, video eligible, both, and whether or not, if video, it has an evidence eligible flag. Uh, the reason for that flag, as some of you listening might be wondering, is, well, how do we prevent thousands upon thousands of documents being uploaded to our SharePoint servers and, and creating a storage problem. And that's one of the elements is your hearing must be eligible to be remote and it must have an evidence flag on it in order to be produced on the website as one you can sign up for. So if someone goes through that process, it's, a, it's an eligible site or eligible case. It's an advance of their hearing. They go to our, our website. They create their statewide identity for the judicial branch in California. As Greg mentioned, that system was developed um, as a pilot by the Los Angeles Superior Court. Um, it was proven as a concept for them. The State Judicial Council here in California was then building one um, for the state. And we said, well, we're working on this project. We would like to use that system. And so they very rapidly got that working for us in very short order um, for it to work and function. So uh, we appreciate, so that that's how they will then sign up and theoretically as other courts um, use this system, they'll be able to use the same login. Login was a big debate for us um, to appear for your video hearing or your telephone hearing. You know, historically, we didn't require a login for telephone appearances. Uh, we'd know who you were once you showed up in court and you know we could verify in that context, no different than walking in the door. But once you introduce evidence, right, we want to make sure that no one's able to go in there and mess with the other party's evidence. Um, we want to make sure they can't delete what you're uploading. We want some control over that, and that made authentication important. So that's how the SharePoint server came in. So someone logs in, creates their user, goes into our parent system, schedules their hearing, um, and then when it, they get their email in their email account um, in order to click on the link and connect via WebRTC. Then at the day, the day of the hearing, uh, well, in advance of the hearing, we run reports to see who's eligible. The case management system has a flag indicating there's a remote party that'll print on the printed calendar or on the digital calendar. Um, and then we can manage that from there. So then the day of the hearing, the courtroom, as Greg mentioned, the courtroom calls in to its own um, video appearances. One side effect that I did not anticipate, but has been invaluable in uh, the current pandemic is we end up moving courtrooms for whatever reason. One courtroom now is overwhelmed. We need to move a few cases down the hall. Uh, we had to close a small courtroom and move all those hearings to a large courtroom due to physical distancing requirements. And the system doesn't care technically 
when you're in department for our case, department 32, and you're hearing department 40's cases, you just call as if you're department 40. And so that has been uh, a large benefit for us. So then the courtroom is controlling that system. Um, they can mute, unmute, just as many of you are doing, and uh, can upload and view evidence submitted by the parties and deal with signatures. So that, that's the whole system, communicating with one another. So what we want to do is not just talk about it. I want to show you a little bit. So we have three different videos. One um, I don't, we don't have time for, or I didn't anticipate time for. So to see how to schedule a remote appearance, we have that video on our website. Um, Greg mentioned it before. It's here listed on the page. You're welcome to go view it as many times as you like. Uh, it's about two and a half or three minutes, I think. And it just walks through uh, how a party accomplishes the actual scheduling of their remote appearance. Um, you don't have to log in for that. It's just a video on the website. But what I want to do now is I want to walk through what we think is one of the more exciting and, and one of the areas that I know many of you are grappling with, which is evidence. So we're going to play a video here. Also, this first one is on our website. It's uh, how the parties upload their evidence. And so I'm going to kind of talk over the top of it as we uh, play it here. Um, but we did envision this largely for civil cases. And so while we released it for small claims, and landlord tenant, we did think about how it would operate in a limited civil uh, or maybe even an unlimited civil case. But here we go. So remote appearances. So how to manage your evidence. So uh, you go onto our website. Uh, the individual would select the evidence button here on our main page, agree to some terms and conditions like uh, the other party is uploading files. And while we scan them, we can't guarantee it. It shows them a list of their cases uh, based on their login. And so here we have this uh, civil case. It then shows them their folder, which is labeled in this case, plaintiff one uh, with their initials or their name. They can see there's no files. And so they simply go down to upload files, click the button. There's a quick drag and drop. So they could drop the files, but in this case, they're gonna choose them. They're gonna choose, well, let's see, we got a lease and we got some door damage here and some carpet. So they're gonna click open. The system is gonna scan those files and check for valid uh, file extensions. And it gives them a little bit of an indicator there on the screen as they upload their file. Once they're done, they can close it and their files are now on our SharePoint server. Uh, it is currently, they can upload them, they can change them and they can manage who else has access. So in the event they need another party on the case, potentially a spouse or something, or if it is an attorney doing it or a paralegal who wants um, the attorney to see it, they can add someone at their discretion and just simply add their um, uh, email address. And we do get a couple of questions here. I will get to those later. Um, and so here they've selected someone, that email will go to that person indicating what delegated access means. So now we're going to go back to their folder and then oh, go back to the folder. Now the question comes, how do you view? Now we locked it so that parties cannot view the other side until one hour before the hearing, because it is not our purpose to support uh, discovery. And we did not want to provide preference to those that were remote versus those in person. And I'll talk about that when the video is done. So here they're going into the other party. It's within an hour, person uploaded some roof damage. They can just click on the picture and it'll pop up. They can click on a, another picture. It'll pop up in their web browser. So any file extension that is uh, readable by the web browser will just open. And those that need to be downloaded will download onto the person's PC and they can open it from there. So that's a really quick overview. That video is on our website. Um, but I, I do want to talk about a moment, the, the pause that occurs. So um, the question here was, how are we handling hybrid appearances where one party is remote, one party is in the courtroom with the judicial officer? So let me talk about that related to evidence. So one concern we had is that if you have one party remote, you have one party in person, the remote party uploads their evidence in advance of the hearing. The in-person party doesn't and both parties can view evidence at any time, our concern was we were granting some level of benefit to the in-person party because they could view the opposing size evidence. So we chose to lock it. Um, we chose an hour before the hearing to mimic small claims when they sort of hand those documents back to each other where the system will automatically enable viewing and enable uh, the parties to view each other's evidence one hour before the hearing. Uh, it also means that at that point it's locked and parties cannot upload new evidence, although I'll show you in a moment in the clerk's view how we allow exceptions to that process. So in terms of hybrid today, what happens is we know on every Monday we hear small claims cases uh, and we have some number of people who are remote uh, and some who have requested an in-person appearance. Those that are remote upload their evidence in advance. Those that are in person, we have a scanning station and we they 
come here. We have a staff member who takes them to the scanning station and walks them through how to scan their documents and upload them so the remote party can see what they're going to display for the judge and the judge can also view it. So uh, we mimic that in-person um, process. It is a little time consuming, I'm not going to lie. Um, and it's a little bit tricky in uh, COVID times to make sure we're keeping everything clean and, and disinfected. So that's how we're doing it. It's a, a hybrid approach and we do support that person on site to get their items uploaded. And then we have uh, laptops that they use in order to view the opposing side's evidence uh, during and before the hearing. Okay, so let me switch over to the clerk view here. So on the clerk side, they log in to uh, the application uh, into the StreamWrite v Court application. They then go into our court and go into evidence. They then search by case number for uh, the case that's on uh, being called at that moment, or perhaps are reviewing it with the judge in advance, depends on your process. The court can see the court's folder, which you see are very tiny, the plaintiff's folder, and the defendant's folder. Uh, they're going to select all these cases and then mark them. And so the process is integrated to automatically mark these exhibits. And once they're marked, it moves them to the court folder. And so they're going to go back and they're going to then go into the defendants. And for some reason here, uh, the defendant decided they didn't want us to review all the things they uploaded. So they're only going to pick two of them. Um, so, yep, uh, so they're just going to pick two and they're going to mark those. Yes, we want to mark them. So those are now marked and they automatically move. And at this point, they've been copied into the court folders, which is important for retention, but they're only marked. Uh, they are not admitted. So the clerk will go into the, the court folder and they can see um, those marked files. And they've talked to the judicial officer, however your process works. And now uh, it's been appended to say, well, this is a plaintiff's item that was marked or a defendant's. It, it adds that to the beginning of the file name. And now they're actually going to move those um, into the admitted folder. And when they do so, it actually adds exhibit in the front and then they put in the number one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D, one, A, one, B, whatever, whatever you're, you know, you decide. And once that is done, those move to the admitted folder and the admitted folder is viewable by all parties at all times. So now when you get into court, uh, everyone can just be viewing the admitted folder if they like, rather than going back and forth between the party folders and view those four files. You know, we want to review the carpet damage. The uh, judge can open up that document as can the remote parties um, and go through that process. So now they're going to open a PDF in this context um, and take a look at, at here's a, a lease and rental agreement. So that's how we manage those exhibits. Um, uh, there's, I'm sure, questions about retention that I'll get to here in a second. Um, but we talked about upload and download times. So you can kind of see the bottom right, this is in view mode which means in view mode, uh, the parties can look at each other's evidence, but they can't upload. Um, so we have an ability here for the clerk to modify it and return it to upload uh, as an override. So you know what hap is happening for us is that in-person individual, as we were talking about in a hybrid situation, it takes us longer to get through those than we would hope. And so the system ends up locking out and saying, well, you're within an hour of your hearing, you can't upload. We have the ability to undo that and then be able to upload that evidence. Um, or if you had a case, if a, a limited civil case is going over multiple days, you know, let's say the judge allows them to introduce new evidence at night, uh, then they can upload that in the evening. In terms of retention, uh, we have policy set on our SharePoint server to delete the parties folders. And Greg, if I get this date wrong, let me know. But um, I think we have it set to be 30 days after their last scheduled appearance, uh, their folder deletes. Um, so if a case is continued, it preserves their documents in their folder. But if that case is heard, no future events are set. 30 days later, uh, the party folders delete. The court folders do not delete by a matter of a system policy. Those are retained just like evidence would be normally. They, they stay until the courtroom clerk uh, notifies uh, court IT to delete them. So that way we're preserving that evidence. We're holding on to it for appeal purposes. Um, we would notify parties before deleting uh, if necessary. So. That is uh, our evidence sharing solution. So if you have questions, feel free. We have a couple in chat here about capturing the audio video um, of the in-person party. I'm sorry, without creating feedback. Yeah, so one of the questions here is how do we deal with audio and video when one party is in the courtroom with the judge without creating feedback? So that was the key to integrating the system with our audio visual systems. So um, our AV systems in the courtroom have, I don't know, Greg, 
how many inputs, something like 100, I don't know, 70, some crazy number. Um, and so all those inputs are still going into our AV system. Those feeds are then um, doing whatever magic the AV folks do. Uh, and they combine into a feed that goes out. And so that system is already controlling feedback. Um, and so we don't get sort of the tunneling that you get sometimes when someone leaves um, their, their feed open and when they're connected through a secondary connection. So let's see, I want to move on here. Uh, so what are some of our lessons learned um, from an integrated approach? And I think some of these you have experienced in yours as well. So uh, one is that communication with a remote party is uh, vital. Um, things happen. Things happen on the court side. Things happen on the party side. And being able to communicate through chat or other means is extremely important. Um, we don't have our system to the place where we would like it in that uh, context yet, although uh, we are we are working on it, and the vendors are working on it quite rapidly and appreciate their support. We learned very early on in those very first probation hearings in January, we wanted to say that you could connect from any cellular connection. And while technically you can, um, as I'm sure you've all experienced, it is intermittent and difficult and um, just results in a more difficult court proceeding. And so at this point, while we don't require Wi-Fi, we do strongly encourage and recommend Wi-Fi or a wired connection and discourage cellular. As Greg mentioned, we use a web uh, RTC connection uh, versus an app-based structure. We made that decision to avoid the need to download an app, which we thought would be easier uh, for remote users. And I think in some contexts it is, except that it, with an app, the app itself is managing those video and audio connections. Um, you know, They ask for your permission and it's done. Um, versus a web RTC, which is running those connections through the web browser. And what we've experienced is a lot of individuals don't know where in their web browser to enable their video and audio. And so that has been a little bit of a challenge. Um, we've added some testing ability on our website so that people can do that in advance. Um, but that's something to consider as you look at these different options. And user support, uh, uh, it continues to be an issue. Um, who is going to and do we support technical questions from the end user? Of course, right now we are the best we can. Um, but we do get those things where we have eight people connected, they can all hear, they can all see, and then one person who can't, and you know, ultimately our answer has to be there's something going on on the far end that we can't predict. Um, there's also questions around on-premises versus remote or uh, cloud-based systems. So on-premises, we have very, very high quality video, but we are restricted on a number of concurrent sessions. So we have to go through a process each day to make sure right now under COVID um, that we're not having too many connections and bringing down the network. As Greg said, we this was a pilot. 86 connections seemed like it would be plenty. Uh, we do um, that many and sometimes more every day at this point, but um, that's one option. Cloud will restrict your video because it sort of compresses it um, as it's coming to you, but you have nearly unlimited connections. Breakout rooms are important, I think, although we have had very little demand for them and really have had no one ask for them. So we do have the capability to do it. Um, but really, it has not been in high demand yet. Signatures, we have, we can do them on the same day. We are doing them same day. And so I think that is something we've been able to prove out as working. The last one, I would imagine you're experiencing too, which is patience is really key with video. Um, we all have become accustomed to the inefficiencies that exist in an in-person appearance. You know, the movement from the back of the courtroom to the front of the courtroom, people picking up their papers and leaving council table. You know, those have become natural to us. And some of the delays that occur through a video appearance, someone double checking their microphone, um, someone fixing that, you know, their video screen or, you know, however else they're dealing with it, you know, those have not become our norm yet. And so some of those delays feel like they are slowing down the courtroom. And I think some of that is just us all becoming accustomed to what are the inefficiencies in this system versus an in-person system. Uh, I think, Greg, there was something else I was going to mention there. One more, but I forgot. OK. So now I want to get to some questions um, that pop up here that I didn't get a chance to answer. So let's see. Um, the question about will, this, will the presentation or slides be available afterwards? I do know it's being recorded and will be available. Um, I'm happy to share the, the slides. I have no problem with that. I don't know how it will affect that. Um, but I'll, we'll work with uh, Nakam on how, how that can happen. A question asking about how is the system handling language access needs? So uh, two different ways. 
so most of the time our interpreter uh, is here on site and so the interpreter is in person and they are just in the courtroom using one of the microphones in the courtroom uh, we do have an extra telephone um, in the courtroom in the event that the interpreter needs to call the remote party and have a conversation with them with counsel uh, who might be on site we did build it with the function that we can send the link to an interpreter and then they would be participating uh, just like any other participant and in the event we need to have them do a breakout room we could with the uh, with the individual party um, separate than that we do have to then create a phone number for them to call and have the party to call if they have to have a conversation just with the interpreter so uh, it has not been a large uh, issue most of the time the interpreter uh, has been in person we are um, it, that is less of an, a challenge for us while we do use many languages um, and this was somewhat muted I think during the last couple of months because case types were handled in different um, you know we did suspend some types of cases for a while we do have a Spanish interpreter on staff and that is by far our highest use and so that has worked out pretty well in that regard um, Got a comment about the steps we're all trying to take related to the pandemic. So um, we have tried to expand as best we can and balance due process with trying to ensure access through remote means. Um, and I think we have learned quite a bit from that, which we think is helpful and will guide us going forward. So I don't, Greg, do you see other questions in the chat here? I do not see any other chat questions. Okay. Oh, there's a question here saying, yes, the slides will be posted tomorrow on the NACM virtual page. So. Um, okay, well, I want to do some thank yous before we close here. So this was a multi-year project. I cannot thank everybody uh, who was involved. We are very proud of our product. We do our, our project and the outcome. Um, the integrated approach to reduce data entry to allow for what we believe is an easy way to connect. We do get questions about why not using Zoom or, or one of the others, because uh, I think people are used to them. But our main answer to that is that for courts to operate and to be productive with video appearances in particular as a primary function, it can't be something that we're responding to on a daily basis. And it has to be embedded wholly within every aspect of our process. So as we've walked through, I, I hope you know, we've tried to do that in terms of due process and defining which types of cases parties can deal with on their own, which they need approval for, and which uh, they need agreement about. If you're ever curious about how we define those, those are on our website. We have a list of, of how that all lays out for parties. We've tried to look at how to simplify the scheduling process, how to simplify the notification process through an email, automated email-based link to the video appearances. We've tried to address how the courtroom can control those proceedings, both from a courtroom clerk or a judicial assistant, depending on your, your titles, uh, to make sure the calendar can move forward and the judges can focus on the law, not on managing um, whether or not someone can be seen or heard. We tried to focus on how to share evidence and how to do so in a way that preserves the party's rights and makes sure the court has access to those documents that are necessary to make a ruling. So uh, we, we think we've done that. We're happy to answer questions here or later. You're welcome to email us or contact us through the website um, or through NACOM. I do wanna thank a lot of people. Um, oh, uh, let me see a quick question. Do, I con do we intend to continue these systems post pandemic? Um, I think so. We haven't defined what those are going to be yet. Uh, I think we have found some proceedings. Probation transfers were wonderful uh, by remote without having people needing to attend. We had a very high fail to appear rate on those prior to offering video um, the, because participants don't want to have to drive on something that uh, would seem pretty simple. It made it much easier for the judges to convey requirements to them. And I think those will continue. Um, I think there are other areas where we might not. We've decided landlord tenant cases, we're a little concerned about those by video. I, I imagine us backing off on those post pandemic. So we'll be doing that evaluation. We haven't yet, but to some extent it will continue, I expect. So some thank yous on our side. I have listed here some specific names from our team uh, who were helpful in this presentation and ensuring we had documentation or Emma uh, Dunn who's listed is our uh, grant coordinator and she is the one assisting parties every day as they need to connect along with a number of our internal staff doing scheduling, and um, taking trouble calls. Our partners externally were Streamrite and ATI Connect, uh, both for the hardware, software, and integration. Uh, I, they, were, they did customize the system for a court. And so it is a court-based system, um, which has been very helpful for us. Our partners at the Los Angeles Superior Court, who we've listed, uh, 
were of great assistance in spinning up an identity management system, uh, which we had no experience on. Same is true at the Judicial Council of California from their, the innovations grant team there for the first two names listed and for their IT division to help uh, get ready for the um, identity management. All of our court staff, our judges, our justice partners, our court users have been very uh, understanding and we appreciate them. And we had a number of former team members who've moved on to, to other work, both within the, the uh, California court system uh, and in the private sector who we could not have completed this project without them, which we have listed on the bottom. So uh, I wanna thank all of them. Thank all of you for, the, for listening today to us. Uh, Greg, thank you for, for everything you've done here and for the, the NACOM team uh, for allowing us to present. So uh, thank you uh, all for listening. And should you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and stay safe, uh, stay healthy. And Greg, unless you have anything else, I think we are, we're done. No, everybody have a great day. All right. Thank you, everyone.